We are back from a break, it was a short break, so we can continue with our last panel, use of administrative resources and pre-election amendments to the state budgets. One of the major influences on electoral processes is typically the use of administrative resources of the central or local government institutions to support election campaigns of certain political parties or candidates or individuals. The panel will overview both international best practices and practices in Georgia, legislative frameworks and different solutions to address this very important and uh, serious challenge. The panel will be moderated by my another my colleague from the Open Government Partnership, Mr. Joseph Foti, Joe, who is the Chief Research Officer, and he has a very rich experience and great knowledge of this best practices from the Open Government Partnership. So please, Joe, floor is yours and success on this panel. Thank you, Georgie, good to see you. Um, and welcome everyone to this final panel. Um, thank you to IDFI for hosting us. And we're um, the Open Government Partnership, uh, my colleague Helen and I are extremely happy to be co-sponsors of this important event in Georgia and wherever else people might be. So um, as mentioned, we're going to tackle the critical issue of the use and misuse of state administrative resources in campaigns and other political activities today. Um, in OGP, the Open Government Partnership, this is a very small, but I think growing area of interest for government's political integrity in general is an area of growing interest. Uh, we have nearly 100 member governments, uh, but probably not enough work being done on this topic yet. So I'm excited to learn more about this topic in the hopes that um, our membership, including Georgia, who was the chair last year, can do more about this and then teach uh, other countries about what the right regulatory and institutional frameworks are to tackle these issues. So we have four panelists today. Um, they're bringing both national and comparative perspectives. What, I, um, what I'm going to do, because I think I'd, we'd rather hear from them on this topic, is you can read their longer biographies in the, uh, in the pamphlet. And we're going to go in the following order. We'll do uh, Nino Rizamadza, uh, who's a lawyer from the International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy, who has experience in Ukraine, but is going to talk about the parliamentary election in Georgia and a little bit beyond that. Catherine Elena, uh, Senior Global Advisor from the International Foundation for Electoral Systems, uh, IFAS. Um, and then we'll go back to Georgia with uh, Mr. Vakushti Menabda, who is from, who's the Democratic Institution Support Program Director from the Georgian Young Lawyers Association. And then we will go to um, Ms. Joy uh, Langston, who's a professor of political science at the uh, Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económicas in Mexico City, or the Center for Research and uh, Economic Teaching, Economic Research and Teaching. So I'm going to ask the speakers, they're each going to answer two questions. We're going to have them limit themselves to five minutes per question. If they want to take less time, that's great, so we can hear from the chat. And then um, we will take questions from the chat after that and do some follow-ups. Uh, but so without further ado, then let's go ahead and get started with Nino um, from the International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy in Georgia. Sure. Nino, what are the main challenges of the Georgian parliamentary election uh, with respect to this important topic, the, the use and misuse of uh, administrative resources? And how has that changed uh, in the context of COVID-19? You're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph, for the question and thanks for having me today. The coronavirus crisis has brought about severe challenges to the world. Georgia has been no exception to the problem, although the country has coped with the health aspects of the pandemic outbreak 
rather effectively. The country's economy has been severely affected as a result of the crisis. While um, the government's uh, fiscal stimulus and uh, higher social security spending was important in mitigating uh, the immediate um, economic impact of the crisis, um, increased public need for social assistance and increased budgetary spending for the purpose has contributed to risk of misuse of public resources. Because of the worldwide uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the 2020 parliamentary elections are led by an extraordinary um, situation. Uh, giving rise to citizens' particular need for financial and uh, social assistance from the state. Um, as large amounts of money are injected into the economy to mitigate the social and economic aspects of the crisis, the risk of abuse of uh, public resources and vote buying dramatically increase. With governments and public officials exploiting the opportunity for their personal and political gains. This, um, as a result, blurs the line between the government and the ruling party. Um, with the history of um, abuse of administrative resources and vote buying, including a massive debt relief scheme involving 600,000 voters uh, announced just nine days uh, prior to the 2018 uh, presidential elections, as well as well-established practice of increasing social and infrastructure expenditures ahead of every elections, the risk of um, the coronavirus crisis being exploited by the ruling uh, Georgian Dream Party for electoral purposes remains particularly high. Uh, charity activity local governments, uh, private businesses or uh, private individuals are especially valuable for socially vulnerable individuals, pe uh, persons with disabilities, the elderly, uh, the children with special needs and individuals that have lost their uh, sources of income, as well as for bus businesses that have lost um, all or um, some of their uh, revenue due to coronavirus. However, under the circumstances, it is important to draw a clear line between projects uh, funded uh, by the state and local self-government budgets and activities of political parties and candidates. Notably, um, International Society for Fair Elections and Democracy, the organization that I work for, has found that uh, municipal bodies uh, themselves did not engage in active political campaigning in the process of providing social aid. However, the line between the state and the ruling party has been blurred as majoritarian members of parliaments are actively involved in um, provision of social assistance and um, are broadly advertising it. Thank you. Um, and so, um, is that so that that's the most common um, tendency in terms of misuse of uh, resources during this election? Then is is infrastructure and social assistance and the use of na national parliamentarians in particular using them. Um, uh, we have different cases of misuse of administrative resources. Um, uh, another example is that, uh, for, uh, for instance, um, the Minister of Defence, uh, under the decision of Minister of Defence, thousands of civilians will have their debts before the Gori Municipality Hospital amounted to a total 1,600,000 lari written off. Um, and uh, uh, um, ISWIT's own monitoring of pre-election environment has also uh, already demonstrated a number of state-funded uh, social uh, assistance uh, initiatives using in campaign of uh, Georgian Dream affiliated politicians. Um, and uh, um, 
it appears that the ruling uh, party is trying to use all administrative resources available at its hands for electoral purposes. Therefore, um, a number of public institutions, instead of implementing social and economic policy priorities, focus on uh, garnering votes um, and uh, putting uh, um, ruling party in a more preferential situation than uh, its competitors. Thank you. Um, that's, thank you for that. We're gonna come back. I have, I have a ton of questions uh, that I'd uh, love to ask. I'm gonna go to Kathy and Alina next and then uh, we'll stay tuned for at the end. Um, Let's see if, if we can get an international perspective. How typical is Georgia? How um, common is this in the context of COVID? So um, what's been, a, maybe Catherine, we can back up a little bit and define what it is. What is the difference between, I'm curious about the difference between vote buying and legal mass patronage, which is you know typical for winning an election and how these are different and um, What's been exacerbated under COVID-19? Uh, uh, we heard about there just being a lot more money in the system, but what else? Right. Thanks, you. Thanks, Joseph. And yeah, I'm happy to sort of define it a little bit in the international perspective. And I think when we think about the abuse of state resources, I think we primarily think about money and state budgets, but obviously it can also cover the use of state personnel um, particularly the use of public media or official government communications. Um, and then of course, just physical assets such as vehicles, government buildings, et cetera. Um, but of course, it definitely also includes money, <laughs> um, but sort of different aspects of that. So how it is spent, when it is spent, um, and even how it's allocated from the central level to the local level in elections. Um, I think it's, pretty obvious that state resources can be used for both, can be misused, I should say, for either personal financial gain or political gain. And obviously both of those have pretty toxic impacts on a country. But the abuse of the resources, um, I think in elections is particularly thorny because it can really play a corruptive force on the perpetuation of political power or basically kind of the roots of state capture. So obviously when a politician wins an election, they may get you know, almost unfettered access to the power of the civil service, to public contractors, to um, government state media, um, and other kinds of support that might be able to give them an ongoing electoral advantage. And then once you've, you're in office, you've then got this incentive to kind of pay back you know, the services that may have been rendered during the election, whether it might be through civil service employment, um, favorable government contracts, um, and other means basically. Um, and then you can also prevent potential reforms that might try and curtail those practices. So it's a really thorny issue. And I think one thing that I focus on particularly in my role with IFAS is that there's almost total immunity for these types of abuses. And part of that is because of the electoral process. If an investigation is start, a criminal investigation is started about vote buying or abuse of state resources in the elections, once the election's over, it's often just forgotten or dropped. If you've won, you kind of want to let it go. If you've lost, people have moved on. It's hard to continue the investigation and prosecution. So it's quite unique that you've got this real problem, but almost total impunity. Um, so I think the long-term effects of political corruption are just deserve a lot more focus. Um, and so what does it do? I've touched on that briefly, but I think it, it introduces or exacerbates existing uh, political or power inequalities. It obviously gives unfair advantage to government candidates or incumbents. But the other thing that's interesting, I think, is it generally compromises the integrity of an election because it undermines competitiveness. So you may have a perfectly run election, um, but the integrity of the process is still undermined. 
And then ultimately, I think it reduces public trust just in the process and then the outcome. And that's a huge issue um, around the world at the moment. And, you know, no less where I am at the moment in the US. Um, just I briefly want to say that it's obviously not an issue that just relates to politicians. I think the integrity of the private sector can be compromised because, you know, the government could pressure companies for donations in exchange for continued business with the state. Um, I think public employees, the judiciary, the security forces, the same thing, either intentionally or under duress, um, could be required to act in the interest of a ruling party rather than the country. And then just to your question on how has this been exacerbated by COVID-19, I mean, IFAS has been talking about this as basically the perfect storm. We've had almost a quarter of the countries in the world postpone their elections, um, even just temporarily. And what does that mean? Potentially, it means more campaign time or more time for the government to potentially put in place types of spending initiatives um, that the opposition does not have access to. In some countries, it's meant that officials who had to resign before elections have been able to come back into office and been able to access those resources more. You've also got increased relief spending, like you said, Joseph, just more money. Um, you've got relaxation on sort of the checks and balances around procurements and how that spending is done. Um, and then you've got restricted parliamentary and judicial activity in some countries simply because of um, you know, the inability to meet together. So I think there's a huge vulnerability that we're seeing at the moment. And I think spending around COVID-19 has reached more than 9 trillion globally. And there's a whole range of different types of spending and measures that have been put in place. Um, but we've just seen, you know, many, many ways that this type of spending or access to resources is being abused in South Africa, I think local government have been accused of um, basically restricting food assistance to members of their own party. In Malaysia, um, emergency funds have been distributed along party lines. Um, and you've also seen, you know, the faces of MPs <laughs> put on relief items such as rice or hand sanitizer. In the US, you've seen relief checks with President Trump's signature on them. Um, in India, you've got the Prime Minister reaching out to media outlets to request that they publish positive stories about COVID-19. So for us, I think this is a major, major political issue. And while we focus on the immediate um, corruption issues around COVID-19, we need to think about the long-term implications that this type of political corruption may have on governance. Great, thank you. Um, turning from uh, the bad side, how, how do you think, what are the solutions um, that countries who have limits on these things, um, policies, institutions, practices that, that help get them past this? Right, and I think there are solutions, right? Although it can be easy to sort of raise the red flag and talk about the bad side. I mean, for IFAS, there are kind of three key pieces, one being the laws, the rules that you have in place. The second part being um, oversight, whether it's by independent institutions, but also journalists, civil society. Um, and then the third piece comes back to that impunity issue that I talked about. We've got to see more enforcement and sanctioning of these issues. Um, and one thing I often talk about is a lot of these um, acts are criminalized in most countries, but what we also need is parallel administrative jurisdiction, because that makes it a lot easier in an election to put a much quicker administrative sanction in place, even if the judicial criminal justice process carries on for, you know, months after the election. I think the parallel jurisdiction is really important. Um, I think Nino mentioned that clear line. So coming back to the laws and the rules, 
that clear line of what is, you know, legitimate expenditure and what is not. And that's really, it's more difficult than you think to define that clear line. <laughs> and what some countries do is, I think, just ban any kind of spending ahead of an election. I think Negro was one example of that. I don't know that that really is the right answer, particularly when you have a situation like this where you need spending. But the more we can define those clear rules, I think the better. Um, Philippines is one example. Congress passed some emergency legislation um, that allowed the president to um, undertake spending without congressional approval, but it clearly defined the types of spending and then it required very clear types of reporting. Um, and I think, you know, to Congress almost weekly, I think. And I think that's sort of one example. Um, on the oversight side, I think we're starting to see countries getting creative about online monitoring of abuses, about more transparency. Um, I know again in Montenegro, um, we've been working actually with some civil society groups and Facebook on types of monitoring that they can do with um, crowd tangle and other things um, to try and highlight basically some of the abuses. Nigeria, there's another example where the president had announced that um, cash payments for COVID-19 would be made through the National Social Register. Um, but the Center for Investigative Reporting was able to analyze the data and actually reveal that less than half, I think, of the vulnerable households on the register were actually receiving it. So the more that we've got that data online and civil society are able to um, you know, analyze it and highlight some of the problems, I think the better we're at. And we're seeing real innovation, which I think is, was, is positive and exciting. Thanks, thank you very much. Um, that's really helpful. So now that we have a good international perspective, uh, we'll zoom back to Georgia. Uh, Vakushti uh, Menabde is from the Georgian Young Lawyers Association. Uh, Vakushti, uh, what are you, um, what, what are you saying again in Georgia, uh, following on what Nina said, following on what Catherine said in terms of how, um, what, what's happening during the election and uh, what are you seeing as the primary problems there, especially in the COVID, with the COVID budgets that have been passed? Uh, Vakushti, you're on mute, I think. You're off now. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, it's a very important point, and uh, I want to tell you uh, some uh, words about uh, situation in Georgia. Uh, and I will continue uh, in Georgian, and the uh, interpreter help us. Cinasarchevno periodši kamukeneba sajaru resursepis politikuri miznebistuis oltis ari problema. Tumsa pandemis pirobepši aman tamate biti motivacija misa heli suplepas ta tamate biti sashuale bebi misa marto partijas rom. Upro advilat tas tomu da sakam da bol regulacijeps da upro advilat ga je martlebina sakutari arajti kuri an sva parti je bis utana soru vitale baši čema ga ne beli mok me debi. Kao kuma kada ne misa upra sajta šori so kamo stigle baze da es problemaris, globalni problema. Tumca iset kore ne pši, sada z demokrati uli akčeve bi čatare bi skamo stile pa astu iset i digvaks, es kide upro astu lepis arsebu situacijas. Čema kolegam ninom izvedi dan, ahsena maštaburi 
մաշտաբուրի պրոյկտի խելիսուպլեպիս, ես իղո կովիդիս ծինա դեկնի մարդուրի անտիկրիս ուլի կեկնիս մեսա մետապի, Սակարդոն սախալգազդայի իրստա ասուցիացիա մի շեղրո սոգատատ ծխատիա խելիսուպլեպա սարձու ա� Սումցա, չվեն իմ թավարի հեկոմենդացիը, արիս իստրոմ ասետ դրոս մը կապիոտ ունդա գայի միջնոս սախնձիպոս դա մարդոլ պարտի է, սախնձիպոտ է մարդոլի պարտի է, սղարի ունդա գայի ունոս ծալիան կապիոտ, Պրեմիր մինիստրմած մաղալինից պանդվույս պիրեպման կաբինետի դան իրդապեր գավուսու ես խազի իմաս, ռոմ ես դախմարեպա դակավ շիրեպումի իղո կարդուլի ոսնեպիս թանշտո մարեստան պատոնի զիտինա իվանիշուրթը � թավիս թավատ նիշնոլովանի ինիցիատիվա, դա անտիկրիս ուլի կեք մայսետի ինիցիատիվա, ռոգոր շեից լեպա իկցես արդի ուլ միզ նեպզե մորգեպ ուլ ակտիվովատ ծինաս առջ։ Ես էտ պակտ էբի, էս իկո գոլազը դ ծինասա արջևնոտ, այս սխադասխա պրոյեկտ էբի, ծինասա արջևնոտ խելիս ուպլեպամը կամույի խենա դա կաղի դա ռոգործ միսի կետի լինեպա, դա առա ռոգործ միսի ալդեպուլեպա։ Սավուկատեսում սայրթաշորիսով պրակտիկած է տաղվնովիտ կարգով մոգալ է գայիզլային զէ, սակարդոլոս խելի սուպլ է բիստույս, դա ուախլոս մոմոլոս չույն ոս կամովակ վեղնեպտ, ռոգոր ունդա դա ներկոս սոցիալուրի � Սախեմցիպով իս է ռոմ էս արջայի թվալոս ադմիստացի ուր եսուսեպիս կամող են ապատ, սաջար ուր եսուսեպիս, ոլիտիկ ուրի միզնեպիս տուս կամող են ապատ, դա մատ մի եցետ շեսած լեվ լոբա, Սակարտոլոս մոգալակերց � ռոգործ մաթի ուպլեպա, դա առա ռոգործ մոցխալեպա կոնգատումլի արդի իստու ոլիտիկուրլի լիտերիս մխլիտը։ Ենքի վերի մաչ։ My next question is then, um, are, there, are there other cases? So you have these cases of the government, um, the political party claiming that aid coming from the state is coming from the political party. Are there other cases that the Georgian uh, Young Lawyers Association has identified um, during this COVID-19 response? Եվ մատլուբա ամշեք իտխիստույս ես մեր շիսած լվոս մանուս սեմ սուպրո մետի ուտխա իմ շեմ տխոյ ապսեր ռոմելից չու են որադղելիս պոկուշի մոյեքցա, նինոմ իսա ու բրա որ սա ինտերեսում շեմ մեր մինդրա որադրեպա կավամախույլով գիտեմ էր չեմ տխով ասէ, այս ուկավ շիրդեպա ոնկոլոգի ուրի պատցին դեպիս մկորնալու բիստա պինանսերվիս կազրդաս, սակարտվովոս թավրոպամ ագվիստոս բողոս մի իղո կատացվոտիլ է բարոմ 
გაფართოებული იყო სამკურნალო მედიკამენტების ნუსხა, რომელსაც სახელმწიფო ფარავს და გაზრდილი იყო ფინანსური პაკეტი. საბოლოოდ ეს დახოთ 50 და 50000 ადამიანს შეეხო და ესენი არიან სხვადასხვა ტიპის მოწყვადი ჯგუფი. მეორე შემთხვევა, რომელზეც ასევე მინდა ყურადღება გამახვილო, უშიდება არა დახმარებას, არამედ ინფრასტრუქტურულ პროექტს მიმდინარეობს ინტერნეტიზაციის ინტერნეტიზაცია არსებობს საქართველოში ინტერნეტიზაციის განვითარების ხუთწლიანი სტრატეგია, რომელიც დაფინანსებულია არა მხოლოდ სახელმწიფოს, უშუალოდ სახელმწიფოს საქართველოს ბიუჯეტით, არამედ მსოფლიო ბანკის ხარდაჭერაც აქ დიდია ამ პროექტში, თუმცა აი რამდენიმე დღის წინ პრემიერ მინისტრის მრჩეველმა ეკონომიკურ საკითხებში ისაუბრა იმაზე რომ ამ პროექტში ძალიან დიდი როლი აქვს ფონდ ქართუს რომლის რომელიც დაკავშირებულია და რომელიც არის კვლავ ისევ და ისევ მართველი პარტიის თანამშრომარესთან და მის საქველმოქმედო მის კონტროლს ქვეშ არსებულ საქველმოქმედო ორგანიზაციას წარმოადგენს. აი ეს ორი მაგალითი აჩვენებს იმას რომ ჩვენ როგორ იყენებენ ადგილობრივი პოლიტიკოსები ერთი მხრივ მოქალაქეების გადასახადებით ხან შევსებულ ბიუჯეტს საკუთარი პოლიტიკური მიზნებისთვის მეორე შემთხვევაში საერთაშორისო დახმარებებსაც ეს ფაქტები რა თქმა უნდა უთანასწორო მდგომარეობაში აყენებს სხვა პოლიტიკურ პარტიებს და მათ არ აძლევს შესაძლებლობას თანასწორ პირობებში აწარმოონ საარჩევნო კამპანია ცხადია ჩვენ დავიწყეთ საუბარი იმით რომ საუბარი იმით რომ ზოგადად აჯარო რესურსების გამოყენება პოლიტიკური მიზნებისთვის გავრცელებული ტენდენცია მთელს მსოფლიოში მათ შორის საქართველოშიც და საუბრობთ იმაზე რომ უბრალოდ კოვიდ სიტუაციამ კარგი შესაძლებლობები შეუქმნა ამ მართულ პარტიებს იმისთვის რომ უფრო უკეთ შე უფრო მარტივად შეძლონ საკუთარი აი ამ არა ეთიკური სტრატეგიების ადაპტირება შექმნილი ვითარებიდან გამომდინარე Thank you very much. Um that's really helpful. So we have the examples of drugs, we have the examples of infrastructure, cash transfers, um contracts. We have a lot of different so many different uh means as well as personnel, vehicles. Uh we have a lot of uh so many channels for the salt to flow through um during these elections. Uh, I think we'll pivot to Mexico. Um which um uh and and Dr. Joy Langston uh professor of political science we're going uh with two questions which are um let's see my notes um looking at Mexico and then I'm interested in generalizing from Mexico and what can Georgia and other countries uh maybe my country uh as well learn from uh the case of Mexico the good and the bad so just starting with the case of Mexico um what are you seeing there and how has that changed over time um and uh welcome and i believe you have you can share your screen directly from there as long as the the moderators have that setting you're on mute still i believe yes as always I forgot to unmute myself. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. This is a super interesting panel for me because I I live in Mexico, I work in Mexico and I study Mexico. And and so I tend to be a little over focused on on one country rather than looking broadly comparatively as as you all do. 
Um, Mexico is a very different country in a sense, or a very different political regime than is Georgia in, in that we do not have a single extremely strong party still that governs over time. This ended in 2000 when the PRI lost the presidential elections to the uh, center-right opposition party known as the PAN. Um, and so there is an enormous amount of electoral competition at every level of government, which makes it um, very different than a country like Georgia, which seems to be an electoral authoritarian nation, which has enormous problems of sort of information and, and overweening government um, activities. In Mexico, I have to say that the sad thing is that there is really no problem with uh, trying to monitor government spending on COVID in Mexico because the Mexican government has decided not to spend any money on COVID. And so in, very much in contrast to probably every other country in the world, instead of countercyclical spending by the, by the federal or the national administration, you have next to no spending by any level of government. The governors don't have enough money. It's a federal system. The, government, the governors don't have enough money to spend and the federal government refuses to take on debt in order to be able to sort of stop the cycle of lost jobs, lost wages, and, and then the inability to spend because people simply don't have any money. So uh, the Mexican economy is going into, I'm not gonna call it a death spiral. That would be vastly over-exaggerating. However, it has come into the worst economic crisis since basically the 30s. So that gives us an idea of there is another way of dealing with COVID, which is not to deal with COVID. And that obviously um, by the left wing uh, populist president, whose name is uh, Lopez Obrador or AMLO for short, AMLO has made this decision um, and he is desperate for the economy to start up at the same time, he refuses to um, spend. So that's not the problem. The problem is not sort of this overwrought government uh, corruption. Rather, I'm going to show a slide here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, could you, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Could you, as the host, let me share, please. <laughs> I'm actually not the host. Maybe Tiana can. Uh... Oh, now I can. Thank you. Yeah. Whoever made that happen, thank you. So here is, um, I assume you can, everyone can see it. Here is the sort of the disaster that happened in Mexican elections over the course of basically nine years. There are uh, elections every three years. And so the PRI, PAN, PRD were the three major parties center, center left, center right. The PRI was the former authoritarian party who was doing extremely well. These are seat counts in the lower house of uh, deputies. And out of 500, you know, they went from having almost half to having 47 deputies out of 500. That's a loss of 80% of their coverage. The PAN did somewhat better, only lost about 50% of its seat counts. And here's the center left PRD, which went from 63, 104, and then basically has petered out and is now holding roughly 20% um, or 20 seats in the lower house of Congress. And in fact, they've lost most of those as their deputies have fled to the, the center left Morena, which is the president's party. And you can see what happened here. It went from 47 seats out of 500 to 256 seats, which means they now hold the majority. So what happened to these three major parties? And I'm gonna show you another graph very quickly, which is, this is how um, voters approve of different political institutions in Mexico. And so you can see here the top um, slotted, slotted line is the electoral authority. And oh, everybody from 2004 to 2009 loved the electoral authority. Nobody really ever loved the parties. You can see this is out of a scale of 10. You can see that nobody ever really loves the party or the Congress people. However, 4.8 and 4.4 are failing grades in, in the way that Mexicans um, grade their classes. So it, teachers grade out of, uh, a, on a scale of 
you know, zero to 10, with six being the lowest, six would be a D for us in the United States, right? So what you can see is basically the entire voting population of Mexico has generally lost an enormous, over the course of uh, 13 years, has lost an enormous amount of confidence in its political system. And what I argue is, um, that is basically due to the parties themselves. And now I'm gonna stop sharing, so it's not annoying. So what I argue is here is that what you have is this crisis of representation. It doesn't have to do with COVID. It has to do with that the parties are in a situation where they cheat on each other. They cheat on other political actors, such as smaller political parties, and they cheat on, and they weaken, have weakened over time in a remarkable way. They've weakened the electoral authority that what they built themselves to monitor and police themselves. The, Mexico was a model of strong electoral authority as recently as 2005, 2006. And yet over time, the politicians in Congress have ruled again and again to weaken in practice, they never say we want to weaken our electoral authority, but in practice through hiring and firings and um, sort of manipulating the amount of time that um, a citizen counselor or a judge can stay in these positions, they have weakened the ability of electoral authorities. There are two. One is the electoral administrators, which is called the INE, and the other is the electoral tribunal, which is called TRIFE. Doesn't matter. So what they've done is by weakening these electoral authorities, they can now cheat on themselves even with even more um, success and frequency. So what they've done here is they've come to a collective action dilemma. While they would prefer to spend all this time, money and energy, not cheating on each other constantly, they can't stop cheating because they've weakened the electoral authority and now that they have done that, they know that even if they stop cheating, the other parties will cheat on them. So they basically coordinated themselves into the corner where you don't want to be, which is it's very difficult for them to come out of it. They have made it so onerous on the part of the electoral authorities to actually catch, prove, and prosecute um, not only vote buying, but just sort of massive spending that the governors, the mayors, and of course the, the presidential administration carries out before every election, be it a federal election, local elections, legislative elections, executive elections, it doesn't matter. Um, and so what I wanted to point out here with the, with the graph on sort of uh, citizen disenchantment with the politicians and the political system is that is one of the true and the worst um, sort of outcomes that we can understand that come from constant cheating on, on um, the electoral systems or the electoral process. It comes to the point where voters think that all parties cheat, it doesn't matter who you are, and politicians are bad, and politics is bad, and we're either going to withdraw from the political process and not vote, or we're simply going to vote for populist outsiders who are charismatic and, and you know, promise the moon because there's nothing to stop them. And this, I think, is one of the worst um, outcomes that we can understand from constant cheating and constant corruption in Mexico. Just one last, um, I haven't talked about the good things, Joseph, sorry, but maybe you can, <laughs> there are not very many good things in the electoral system in Mexico these days. So just one quick, um, point about the difference between corruption and vote buying. Clientelism is, of course, a form of corruption, as Vajuski pointed out quite rightly. You're not getting a charity from a political party. You're mm -hmm. getting a government service. But however, if they deny access to all except their own political partisans, then of course it becomes some sort of charity instead of a public service or a public good. The problem is in Mexico, you have both things. You have both uh, clientelism, which is a long term, you know, that can last for decades, a long term sort of relationship between 
politicians, the party brokers who actually sort of bring voters and the politicians together and the residents of especially poorer areas. And that is clientelism, that is long-term corruption, is long-term um, problems with distinguishing between a charity from your party and a government public good. And the second thing is vote buying. And this happens in Mexico a great deal, whether, and this leads back to another problem with the Mexican um, set of rules. Vote buying is simply, you go and you stand in front of the, the voting station or the polling station and you offer $25 for somebody's vote, 25 to $50. This is an enormous amount of money if you wanna change the direction of an election, right? And obviously it would be much better if you didn't spend that money on vote buying, but if you spent that money on you know, campaigning on programmatic promises. However, in Mexico, they do both. They both vote buy and have long-term um, clientelistic relationships. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and your focus is mostly in, um, is in Mexico, what do you think Georgians can learn from either from Mexico back when it was good yeah, <laughs> or exactly. from the fall of Mexico or from what might redeem it? Um, how, or beyond Georgia, of course, what can the rest of us learn as well? There is something very frightening about what happened to Mexico and why, because after a 70 year authoritarian period, it was a voted transition there was very little violence, very little, you know, very little, po little political sort of assassinations. This transition from an authoritarian party to a, demo a working democracy happened over this span of 12 years. And it happened because voters slowly saw different parties as viable options for governing. It was crucial. This is like the best transition from an authoritarian government that you can have. And during this, you know, this one period of time from probably 1997 to 2003, the electoral, authority, the electoral authority in both of its manifestations was very strong, extremely well respected and did its job. You see these huge fines that were um, basically placed against the, the new ruling party, the PAN in 2000, and the old ruling party, the PRI, uh, after the 2000 elections. They did their job so well, the electoral authority at that point, that basically what happened was the parties decided they couldn't afford and they did not want a strong electoral authority any longer. And this began the downfall. And, you know, there are many steps to the downfall. It didn't happen overnight. It happened over the course of several electoral reforms. And so what I would say is <sighs> the best way, you know, and, and the Mexican electoral system is extraordinarily overregulated. So rulemaking does not help because um, it's, it's very easy to manipulate. It's very easy to ignore when you hold power in the two houses of Congress that are needed to pass electoral reforms. And so what is the story here is basically the parties have to understand at you know, time one, that if they continue if in, a, in a competitive system, if they continue to cheat on each other, cheat on the rules, cheat on the system, cheat on other smaller political actors, then they will bring about their own demise and perhaps the demise of the actual party system which obviously could lead to possibly, I'm not saying it will happen, the demise of democracy in Mexico as we know it. And what we would be looking at is some sort of situation very comparable to Peru, to Ecuador, Venezuela, Venezuela and, other, um, and other nations in Latin America who just simply don't have strong parties. They have personalized electoral vehicles, they use those to win office and then they disappear. Voters have no way of understanding what this person or this set of people represent. There is no programmatic, um, there are no programmatic promises and is basically, you know, an unstable disaster as we saw in Ecuador, Venezuela and Peru. So um, what can you say? Try and explain to the party leaders why cheating today is a really bad idea 
for 20 years from now. The problem is nobody thinks 20 years from now. They think about the election that they need to win in June, in, in Mexico's case, in June of 2021, okay? And, and it's extremely difficult to understand how cheating leads long-term to a far worse political situation than just losing the next election, so. Thank you, it sounds like a good opportunity for a researching and see advantages of pro uh, <laughs> pro electoral regulation uh, or something. Uh, there's uh, definitely some research to do there. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to encourage people who are uh, signed in on the chat to go ahead and ask us questions. Um, very quickly, what I'll do is uh, maybe I will ask our panelists, short, keep it maybe one minute. Do you have responses to things your colleagues said? Uh, remind you of something that you wanted to say or uh, can you draw parallels from the Mexican case to the Georgian case? Can you... Um, have we missed something that you think is absolutely critical for uh, Georgia, its neighbors, countries in a similar situation? Um, whomever, yeah, Catherine, please. Thanks, Joseph. And I've really enjoyed listening to all of the panelists, even if we are highlighting so many challenges. <laughs> um, I think there are solutions. Um, Joy was, I won't say great listening to you, but very familiar. Um, IFAS has partnered very closely with both of the electoral institutions for many years now, and have certainly witnessed some of the challenges you're talking about. And I think, firstly, I, I wanna reinforce your point that strong electoral institutions, strong oversight institutions are so fundamental. Um, and civil society, journalists, many groups need to protect those institutions now more than ever. Um, I will say sometimes it's challenging when it's the electoral institution that is also responsible for um, dealing with campaign finance issues, abuse of state resources. Sometimes they're so overwhelmed with just the um, process of holding the elections that it can be difficult to hold this mandate. We did a study in Brazil actually where there are multiple institutions that have some kind of mandate specifically over the abuse of state resources. And we thought that that kind of overlapping mandate would be a problem. It would mean that they would all just pass the responsibility. But actually the overlap kind of strengthened it a little because there was at least a certain amount of oversight from the different institutions. So just reinforcing the point that our institutions are sort of more important than ever. And I think you can look to the US and see, we don't even have a strong central, you know, electoral authority. So it's in many ways, no surprise we're in this situation. And I think for many years, people have seen the, um, the decentralized election administration in the US as a strength, but in, in actual fact, it's the opposite because all you need to do in a presidential election in the US is manipulate or influence less than 1% of votes in a geographically defined area. So a strong centralized electoral authority is, is so important. Just two quick other points. You talked about over-regulation and the ease of reform. Um, I definitely agree. And I know in Mexico, much of the law in elections is in the constitution. And then there is a process of reform after every electoral cycle. I would just say on the flip side, you don't want a situation like the US where there is resistance to reform. So we have these outdated problematic laws, whether in the constitution or down, that people will not change because they are the foundation of US democracy. And so we end up in a situation where there is never uh, the possibility of reforming very problematic systems. The key is getting the right rules the right amount of balance and then the institution that can actually enforce them. And then lastly, I would say, I feel like um, peer support has become more important than ever, particularly for election institutions and for judiciary. Um, we work very closely in Georgia with the CEC, with, um, with some of the judges who are dealing with election cases and connect them in kind of support networks, I think, because when you have a CEC, a 
you know, judiciary coming under pressure, political pressure during elections. It can it help to have international or regional support, I think, to provide at least some cover for those institutions. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, that's really helpful. Um, I am, uh, do others have comments, interventions? Otherwise, I'm happy to. Yes, uh, Vakushti, I see your hand. I believe you're still on mute. Yeah. Um, mm. Uh, <laughs> Mati tam sahure baro. Kartun context it shemi kadu sahedi da neseti aro mat mat takarkes. To bas tole di bit omrom sina kuala penze va para kopen karda imisa rats khalsa darkes. Ta rats khalsa zukes. Sapan yo tribune bi aktiyes urtir ta piris pire bis piro nuli ushina arso konflikte bi sare. Da absoluturi principe opa. Romelit sa pozicije bis mudmi vtsale ba to baši opilim trebi se atniore ba da to isvisat sadre tavar problema da tavar pernis ka tavar šema pernis faktora sa kaudnen dresu koje mati uahu esmo kašire biadi. Kuši sa kartološi ga mu pernda arti ulisije. Polova da i koda, pojela partiji si ja ga mu kod onda vinra, vin zarad vina, arče u nekši. Da, esari krestomati uli magaliti politiku garpunilepis. Esi je bi, ali krestomati uli magaliti politiku garpunilepis. A mi šem dek, kad se čujenak nahit. Zalijenc nelija, Jod isto denan doba manj car se bo pres politikuri partije bi smi imat. Ese cari sa obatajt, ali ima delo biti demokrati iz krizis iz mizez. Jo, politikuri partije bi vera her heben sa zogadove bi s interese bi. Ali ima delo biti hod sakutari da elituri interese bi s elituri interese bi s interese bi s interese bi s interese bi s hadija šem da gicu je vsu koje sva procese bi gicu je vsu ultra Ме мажуне чупе би се газлире бас на хеврат паштури партија би се газлире бас тоа со плиоши да ја сетам зиме ше дегепс ромлис момстрени варт покијани со ривен апрут. Таа се сум идема. Убрао од мадлова ми до тога да ми хада кој лам сме на листвис да па на листвис твис ам се интересува дискусија што ми нацијал. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, we've talked about the recommendations a little bit. We've talked about the falls from grace. I'm wondering if people would be interested. Obviously there are moments of improvement too. And historically, I, I, I will ask, what are the drivers of those? Do they come from civil society? Why are there detentes? So you have a standoff, then at some point, you know, and you, or you have a collective action problem, as Joy has said, where people are not being transparent, they're not having independent oversight. Clearly, not all countries go this direction. Um, and maybe more countries are even going the right way, maybe not at this particular moment, but over the last several decades, we'd hope that electoral commissions and affiliated institutions have gotten stronger. Uh, if we can't generalize, at least we could maybe have some generalizable cases or uh, periods of time. Why that? Why does that happen? Yeah, Nino, thank you. Um, 
so when it comes to Georgia, I would say that Georgia has uh, electoral legal framework in order to protect election integrity, um, even from misuse of administrative resources. However, problem remains unsolved because of lack of political will from ruling party and lack of political culture. Uh, for example, as the parliamentary elections approach in, in Georgia, authorities are initiating various social projects, as Vahushti mentioned, um, uh, and uh, at financially assisting uh, specific so, so social groups, these projects were not known two months prior to the elections, which is a serious problem uh, for us. The purpose and the extent of the projects lead us to believe that uh, these uh, initiatives are related to elections and their aim is to increase support of the uh, ruling party uh, 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 during the elections. Um, yeah. uh, medical and public health imperatives uh, are indeed crucial in pandemic situation, but uh, as recent experience has illustrated, absence of uh, stringent financial regulations and softened checks and balance system can bring about based of the already um, scare uh, public resources, making the overall pandemic response less effective. Uh, and transparency is also important for um, ensuring the government plans um, uh, that are legitimate and uh, um, that they enjoy public confidence. Joseph, if I could just speak to that question a little bit. Um, by talking about two things. The first thing is there are two ways to get out of this. Um, as I'm an academic, not a practitioner, I tend to be a little bit more sort of over theoretical. But there are two ways to get out of a, of a collective action problem. One is that the actors coordinate around future benefits. This clearly hasn't happened. And the second is that there's some sort of you know, overarching power that comes in and forces them to start um, obeying the rules that they themselves have made. So on the first point, the problem that you see is that they were never able to coordinate out of this, out of this problem. And so they basically drove themselves off a cliff. The, the three parties, the three main parties, which allowed Morena and, and the new president, well, not so new anymore, uh, Lopez Obrador to win this enormous victory. Now, what would, what would one would have thought that if polit politicians here are very astute, very smart, they must know on some level that their own behavior caused these terrible voting numbers. So what they should want Morena to do is create obligate them to basically strengthen the electoral authority. Why? Because Morena will win probably for the next several elections. And so what Morena should want is to institute much stronger uh, electoral authority that will be quick to certify its victories, right? That's what you would think would happen. And unfortunately, it's not happening. Morena continues to practice many of the same tricks of the trade that the three major parties had undertaken over the past, let's say, 18 years, 20 years. So unfortunately, Morena has lost its promise to strengthen the electoral authority, which would have helped it. So that's, that's what I will say to that. I did it myself. Uh, it will go to Catherine, and then I think you'll have the, and then we'll, we're going to wrap up because we are how close? We're three minutes from time, and we need a good ending. Um, go ahead. I get the last word. Um, I just want to add on to that because I'm a practitioner versus an academic, so I obviously focus on the how. And how do you get to that point where you change the incentives for these parties? And I, that, that comes at the end of a chain, I think. And 
I'm originally from New Zealand and I spend a lot of time thinking about <clears throat> why New Zealand really has almost none of these problems um, and, you know, quite a strong culture of integrity. And I think that's just part of it. You have got to have this culture of integrity in a country and expectations of that kind of behavior. But that takes the creation, I think, of a lot of pockets of integrity and mutual accountability whether it's private sector, civil society, the electoral institutions, perhaps eventually the parties. And I think you need almost this domino effect. Um, so once you almost, you know, strengthen these kind of integrity mechanisms over time, um, eventually I think you can get to this tipping point where the incentives overall are changed and the parties in a way almost have no choice as opposed to them coming to that on their own um, so I think that's kind of how I see it and again I come back to the institutions the electoral institutions but other independent oversight institutions and civil society I think are the ones that start that domino effect I'll stop there and <laughs> give you time to wrap up I really enjoyed the discussion thank you yeah, this I, I came in, I told I was telling the speakers yesterday that I know very little about this topic, um, as it's not a focus yet in um, among our, our membership. Um, and so I really appreciate just the quality of and specificity of the panelists and giving us these examples. Um, I want to thank uh, you guys from two angles. One first, thanks for participating in the panel. But thank you for continuing to fight uh, for what is a common pool resource, which is the election, right? And the integrity of our elections and the integrity of our government. And um, I look forward to maybe Georgia putting more uh, commitments. Maybe we can use OGP as a lever, Georgie, uh, for international level commitments from the government of Georgia on these issues. And maybe they can do an exchange with the government of Mexico. Um, <laughs> facilitated by IFAS. Um, so we, uh, anyways, many, many thanks. There's a lot of work to do. Um, these things are harder under the, under the constraints of COVID. Uh, the, there is more opportunity, fewer checks and balances. But I think the, the last thing that Catherine said is where I hope is civil society can play a significant role in getting the ball started here and convincing elected officials that this is in their short-term and long-term interest. Um, and that research, knowledge, uh, opportunities to come together like this are gonna be essential to making sure that happens. So thank you all and back over to Georgie. Thank you very much, Joe, for moderation and to all panelists, especially Joe to you, Joy and Catherine for joining us from overseas and to my colleagues from Georgia, Bahusti and Nino. It was really, really interesting for me to hear both international and Georgian experience about the very important topics because we are uh, at a very close to elections and these are the things that has to be considered. Actually the whole, not only this panel, but the whole conference was uh, actually for the idea to consider the international practice, good practices, regulations that we can we can in future use in Georgia. So thank you very much. And I very much appreciate your contribution to, to our Good Governance Forum.